Today is September 29th, 2017, and this is the beginning of an interview with David Spence, a U.S. Navy veteran. My name is Laura Gill, and I will be the interviewer here at the Bob Kirby Branch Library in Bowling Green, Kentucky. So, thank you, David, for being here and for um, allowing us to hear your story. And I would uh, like to start off with um, asking you if you could tell us a little bit about yourself, um, where and when you were born, uh, maybe something about your parents, um, siblings, so you can share what sure. you like. Well, my name's Dave, Dave Spence. Uh, I was born in Detroit. Uh, my mother's family is from Detroit. My father's family were from Eastern Kentucky. And after World War II, a lot of the, the families migrated from Eastern Kentucky up there, so that's how my mom and dad uh, met. Uh, my mother's family on her mother's side were uh, immigrant Hungarians. They came over in the 1920s. And on her father's side, uh, uh, some of the family goes back a ways, and then some of them, uh, Lithuania and Ireland. Um, so I was born in, well, not exactly in Detroit. I was actually born uh, in a place called Eloise. It was. Uh, in the early days, early 1800s, it was a, a tuberculosis sanitarium, oh, wow. uh, insane asylum, and, and the story goes, when my mom went to labor with me, they, they were poor, they didn't have insurance, so the hospital would go somewhere else, so that's where I ended up going and being born. It was also a hospital, too, it wasn't just a, yeah. a TB uh, insane asylum. <laughs> um, so do you my, have I got a brother. Um, he also served the Navy. I have a cousin that he's, he's kind of, I, I, I call him a brother too, he served in the Navy. Um, it's kind of a, a tradition in our family, water. Grand, one of my grandfathers was a, a tugboat captain and also in the Navy. Oh, wow. Another, a lot of family that were in the Navy and other military branches. Very good. So, um, so you said you served um, in the Navy and how, how long? Um, was your uh, service? I joined, um, well, I actually would, I kind of joined the Army when I was young, like I was 15 or 16, kind of like a delayed entry program. And uh, my mom, we went on a road trip. Uh, I had an aunt who was working with a, uh, a mobile uh, health clinic, and they were in Texas. And on our way, we stopped in Mobile. And uh, of course, my grandpa's didn't like them the fact that I might go in the Army, but uh, we toured the USS Alabama, oh. and uh, I changed my mind. <laughs> <laughs> and so you had to go back and tell the right. Army that oh, right. I did So, mind. no, I didn't even go in there. I just walked, went, went into the, the recruiter. So I went in the Navy in 1988 in June, as soon as I was less than, less than a month out of high school. Oh, wow. Went right in. So, um, where did you uh, go to high school? I did went to Warren East High School here in Warren County. Warren County. Yep. So, did you um, you and you and how long were you um, in the Bowling Green area? Okay, my grandpa. I, I guess you would call him my step grandpa, but he was always my grandpa. His family's from down here. Um, like I was saying, a lot of folks moved up to Detroit up north for work. So he had brothers uh, living up there. He he was retired Navy. He joined the Navy um, in 1942. Oh. His brothers were in the Navy, and they were all torpedoemen. Uh, two of his brothers were at Pearl Harbor, and then one was on submarines, one was on a cruiser. He stayed in, and they all retired, but he retired in 1964, and he was in Michigan, Detroit. He was a carpenter. He retired out of that, and uh, him and my grandma, I don't know exactly how they met, but uh, they moved sometime about 1972-73. He moved back down to Kentucky, down here in uh, the Richardsville area, Riverside area, yeah. north, north, north of here, Bowling Green. So uh, about 19, my mom, we came down sometime in the mid-70s on a vacation just to see grandma and grandpa. And, told dad about it and then we brought him down and we went back to we were living in Ohio at the time Brian just outside of Toledo and uh, when my dad saw where where grandma and grandpa live we went back in two weeks we packed everything and went and moved down down so here moved down it was here. 1979 I was 10 
Wow. So I call this home down here. Yeah. I grew up down here. Okay. So um, what uh, did you choose what job that you did yes. in the Navy? Mm -hmm. Okay. So can you talk about that? Okay. Well, Where you we, went to basic? Right. Um, so I went in on a delayed entry program. I was still in high school. So it was kind of like a semi pledging to go in the Navy and you could the Navy, as well as all different branches, uh, have technical fields. But the, the Navy, I, it, it was very diverse in the different jobs. And of course, Grandpa was a torpedo man. And, uh, <laughs> no pressure on no, any of them. Huh? No, not really. Uh, he asked me later when I was home on leave one time. He asked me, "Why do you want to be a torpedo man?" He says, "Well, you're a torpedo man." Yeah. You know, I was out in the country. I didn't, you know, I you didn't really have any ideals on career-wise, it was probably not a good career choice. You know, there's not too many torpedo in the civilian world, but right. um, I don't regret it. Um, but, um, so I signed up to be a torpedo man. And uh, so when I graduated high school, I went to, well, first I went to the, the MEP station down in Nashville, which I don't think is there anymore. Uh, you go through that. Um, what was it like when you got sworn in? Were you alone well, or did you have family? I was alone. Family? It was scary. Was um, scary. <laughs> I was there all day at the SMEP station going to, you know, you're getting checked, poking, prodded, interviews, uh, fingerprinted by a big old Marine guy. That, he was really scary. <laughs> uh, that, that guy, he was, the Marines really impressed me how disciplined and, and their, their bearing. Demeanor, they were, yeah. yeah, their demeanor. Um, I remember he fingerprinted me. It was he was a control. <laughs> yeah. Um. So I don't know why I was a lot. I mean, there was they were just swearing guys, and like this room would be just full of guys. I don't know why I didn't get into all that. And uh, finally, I was the last person, and it was all by myself. Oh my goodness! Yeah. And it was late in the day, and then they give you a plane ticket. And, off I went to Orlando, Florida. So did you leave from yes. right from the Met station? You didn't yeah. have any time okay. for being sworn in? No, no, oh. no. As soon as I swore in, here's your ticket, off you go. Oh, so wow. okay. now, before I get to there, I had to get to the Met station. Um, <laughs> I left at the Greyhounds bus station, which is where the Daily News is. It's the yeah. parking lot. Um, what the Daily News is, and right across the street is the parking structure. Right. For the hit sense or whatever that is now, there used to the the, the Greyhound station was there, and my dad worked at the Daily News, so he was there at work. And uh, I remember the bus pulling in, and you know, said goodbyes. And I get on, and I'm looking on, looking out, the windows kind of getting weak. Yeah. <laughs> oh. Sorry. <laughs> no, it's okay because because it was a, a big deal, big time for you. Um, I know that's. Uh, um, that's and I remember thing. the bus ride down there. <laughs> you know, we would, we didn't take the interstate. We were driving down 31W, which is the old U.S. highway. You're stopping at every little town, picking up people, and, and, the, and I sat up front, and the front of the bus was just going up and down. So, <laughs> time I got to Nashville, I, I had this screaming headache. So. Oh, and then you were there all day. Oh, wow. Yeah. So, um, where did you go to basic training? So, I went to Orlando, Florida, and the three uh, recruit training commands were in Orlando. Uh, Orlando was established in 1969, so it was fairly new. There was one in San Diego, I don't know exactly when that was established, and then the old one was in Great Lakes in Chicago. My, my uh, school for torpedo was down in Orlando, so that was probably just obvious to send me down there. So how long, um, I know when I was in the Army, our basic training was two months. So how, how long? Oh, let's see. It was like eight weeks. It wasn't long. I know, yeah, eight weeks. Um, I know the Marines, they're like 12, uh, the Army, I don't, yeah, it was, two, it was longer. Yeah. Um, so we get to Orlando, I fly in. I mean, and this is the first time we flew an airplane. That was exciting. Oh, wow, you had a lot of big things. <laughs> yeah, it was. Uh, so we, we get, we drive to the base, beautiful base, and you go in, you're in some clothes, and you're, 
of course, you know, zero tolerance for drugs. So you're, it's, it's like you're doing uh, your analysis test like every turn. <laughs> so we get there and they, I remember standing in the line and they give you a, what we call a ditty bag. That's an old Navy term for a little bag with all your toothpaste and yeah. whatever. And uh, I, had, I couldn't go, so there's a bunch of us, they were giving us water, and we're walking <laughs> around in circles all night long. And I didn't get to bed till like, I don't know, one or two o'clock in the morning. So I finally get to a barracks, and they give me, everything's gotta be locked up. And they didn't tell me about this lock, that you couldn't, um, you couldn't take the key out unless it was locked. So I throw everything in this locker, and, uh, so they get us up, I don't know, it was like five o'clock in the morning. Uh, I didn't have time to brush teeth, take a shower, anything. You can go to the restroom, I had to go in there. And I'm trying to figure out, how, I'm, that's what happened. I was trying to get this lock. Why is the key not coming out? And finally, someone had to tell me, you gotta take, the, you gotta lock it to uh, do it. So so I never got to go to the restroom. So they're marching, we, did, we, we met our company commanders and the guys and uh, they marched us to our our barracks. First week is what they call processing week. You're, it's where you're you're getting your hair cut, which was cool. I like that. <laughs> um, you're learning how to march, learning some you know basic commands, how to move around. Uh, you're getting shots. They're processing you, dental, all that. It's, it's, it's a process. You're getting your uniform. Um, of course, the boots I got were like five sizes too bigger than what I should have got. Uh, everything, the, when you get your uniform, um, you know, you got your sea bag and you're going there and there's, they size you up and they're just guesting and they're throwing this stuff in your bag and then you gotta label it. We get these stencil pens and we get a stencil card and half the day you're oh. putting your, you're, you're labeling everything with your, your name, um, last for your social security and then like for your like our working uniforms which we call dungarees is just like a, a blue kind of shirt and like blue jeans you know you, you got to have exactly you know yeah. labels and on your <laughs> back pocket and those pants these clothes i'll never forget the smell of it um they had this i don't know if it was a starch or something but it, it had this particular smell and it'd take two or three washings for that stuff to actually, it would actually stain your skin. Oh my goodness. So you get all your uniforms and then you go to your barracks and you get your rack and then you meet people and they yeah. divide you up in sections. And so did you um, have a, did you make any friends in basic training um, that you still keep in contact yeah, with? Yeah, uh, of course the guy that was my, the guy, I, I slept on top, and he slept on the bottom, and uh, he helped me out a lot. Uh, this is a new experience. I was first time away from home. Yeah. Um, were most of the people there older than you, or? Uh, no, you you, most of them were just teenagers. We did have some older guys, and I would say older, but maybe in their 20s, mm -hmm. 23, 24. Some of those guys had already been to, like, had gone to college, and yeah. usually, when when a company's formed, the company commanders they're looking at files and they're you know, they're looking who who could be the leaders right. in the in the in the company. So usually the guys that are were older or maybe um, had some college under their belt, they usually got uh, some leadership roles. And, and these these were like recruit leadership roles, right. which were mirrored to the regular roles. Like you know we did with you know, the our head recruit was called a re recruit chief petty officer, and you had a leading petty officers, and each each one got to wear the, the insignia of the rank that right. they were recruit. And so it was kind of mirroring the same thing that you would outside the, the clawed out duties. Mm -hmm. You know, you had someone in charge of laundry, someone in charge of mail. These were collateral duties. Uh, I never got any of those. Yeah. Did you ever have KP? Uh, okay. <laughs> I, oh. You're talking about is a discipline? No, <laughs> like the kitchen patrol. Okay. You ever have to do that? Yeah. Uh, we, well, we have. We don't call it KP. Call it. So there was one. I think it was the third week. It was called service week, where you're not really doing training. Uh -huh. uh, you get farmed out, and 
most of everybody goes to the galley. And so we went, I got to go to the galley. Some of the more experienced ones got to do some fun stuff or, you know, need jobs, but most of us went to the galley. Um, I think the first week there I was on the, yeah, it was the first week, two weeks, I can't remember. No, no, it was just one week. Maybe the first day, days seemed like weeks. Yeah. Uh, I was working the line, the chow line, you know, putting the food yeah. and you're swabbing, you're always cleaning. And uh, maybe for two days, and after that, uh, we went to we were painting barracks, but most of the time we were just goofing off. Yeah, it was kind of laid back, you know. We were yeah. um, not doing, um, you know, it was it wasn't as uh, regimented. We were we could relax a little bit, and breathe. Yeah. So after your um, after your basic training, um, so talk, tell us a little bit about your uh, torpedo training. What, okay. So. You know, and that was in the same place you said. Right? Yeah. Okay. So uh, let me talk a little more about the boot camp thing. Sure. Um, okay. Just you know what kind of training we, we did firefighting. You know the the administrative courtesies, uh, the law, and all that. How to salute. A lot of the training was like basic shipboard stuff, safety, um, firefighting, which is a big deal in the Navy. And then you graduate and do the little March thing, graduation. And so the day after, um, you know, graduation, everybody gets their orders and they're, you know, some. It's a big deal. Yeah, it's a big deal. Everybody's disappearing and uh, going all across the United States where these different service schools were, were you know. And uh, so I was a torpedoman and I wasn't a torpedoman yet. I had to go through the school. So the base I was on, it was Orlando. The actual name of the base was called Naval Training Center Orlando, and one of the subcommands was Recruit Training Command. There were satellite commands underneath. Them. So I go from Recruit Training Command to a Service School Command. Service schools would be the there was quartermasters, there were singlemen, torpedomen, and then there was those that didn't. Uh, were not did not pick a specific job. It was called undesignated, and um, there was a kind of a training school there too. Uh, basically, seamanship. They were basically as soon as they were done with that for a couple of weeks, they're going straight out to the fleet, and basically you're working in deck as a what we call a non-rate or undesignated. But once you get on the ship and you see some kind of field of work that you might be interested, you could what we call strike for that. Oh, and actually okay. be attached to that division, but if you didn't, you're working with deck. That means chipping and painting, and just uh, yeah. yeah, it was not good. It was good to get your job. <laughs> right in. So I went to the Torpedo and A school. Um, the schools they had different categories. Like A school was your basic, and then they had what was called a C school, was which was more technical. So A school, you start, you know. Start off with some basic math and uh, basic electronics, electricity, and then you get into the nuts and bolts of you know different torpedoes. And torpedoing, um, uh, we're, we're not just dealing with torpedoes. We also deal with uh, certain missiles like the Harpoon missiles, Tomahawk cruise missiles, wow. and a torpedo tube maintenance. A lot of this is maintenance of launching systems. Uh, the magazines where this stuff is stored, the sprinkler systems, the security, the operation of launchers and things like that, and the maintenance of the weapons themselves. So you're, it's very basic what you're learning. Uh, mostly torpedo stuff. And torpedoes are not just launched from submarines. When I tell people I was a torpedo, it's, oh, you were on a submarine? I said, no, I was on a submarine. Uh, I was on a submarine tender. I'll tell you more about that here in a few minutes. Yeah. So the you know submarine torpedoes can be launched from submarines. It can be from surface ships as well as helicopters and certain airplanes. So you have to have a background and all that stuff. So when I got done, well, when I graduated, the torpedo aspect of that school, the next phase of it was called tubes. So the people in my class, some of them were volunteered to go to submarines. They had volunteered for submarine duty. So they were not going to do surface torpedo tubes, they were going to do submarine torpedo tubes. And they had a mock-up in the school. And then we had a mock-up of the surface tubes. And 
um, sometime before all this happened, we got to pick, you know, our duty stations, and usually oh. they'll bring a list of, of potential places to go, and whoever has the highest ranking grade in the class gets to pick first. Oh. So, the I think the first three or four. One guy, actually the guy that was the highest ranking, he was going to SEAL school right after this class. He was going to try, I don't know if he ever made it, but, uh, and then the next couple of guys were going to submarines. So, so I was, the, I got to be the number one guy to pick. Yeah. And you get a, a wish, a dream, what we call a dream sheet, and you write down places that you might want to go. And uh, I want to go overseas. And I thought, hmm, Italy, would be a cool place to go. And, uh, but, you know, I was thinking of destroyer or battleship. Of course, there's no such thing as torpedo tubes on battleships, <laughs> uh, cruisers, whatever. So when the list came down, um, there was there was USS Stark, and that was a little that that ship had a little I wouldn't say a taint to it, but that ship had gotten uh, hit by missiles in uh, the Persian Gulf. So we had you know it's like. Ooh, the ship got, I remember the ship getting hit by missiles back in the 80s, mid 80s. So I didn't pick that ship. There was the USS uh, Carl Vincent, which was in California, but a guy, he wanted to go out there because his girlfriend was in Sasson. I don't worry. And then there was uh, some other ships, and there was uh, three slots on a submarine tender in Italy. And I didn't know what a submarine tender was. It's like it was La Maddalena Sardinia. I never heard of that place before, didn't know where it was. So I picked that, oh. and then because I picked that, I didn't get to go through torpedo tube school. They, me and the two other guys that selected those billets to that ship, they pulled us out and they sent us through uh, uh, a, a higher technical school for Tomahawk cruise missiles. Oh, wow. And basically what we were trained to do, um, I can either confirm or deny, <laughs> but to warhead the nuclear variant of that missile. Wow. Yeah, here's a 19-year-old kid learning how to build nuclear bombs. That's, yeah. That's, <laughs> yeah, like, that's wow. a big deal. Yeah. So how, um, so how long was that training? It was only four weeks. And then, and then you went on so, to Italy? So after I graduated, that was probably sometime in October. And I, I, mean, I got a lot of good memories of Orlando, that mm -hmm. place. I love that place. Uh, the base was awesome. Um, I used to walk all over the place um, down there. Go to, there was a, an arboretum. Uh, botanical that garden and I'd walk off the base and go visit. Uh, so I went home on leave for a couple of weeks and I got orders to go to Norfolk, Virginia. I had to go to, through over, overseas screening and overseas kind of training. Right. What to expect, terrorism and all that. There was a lot of, not the type of terrorism that we know of today, but it was like people getting kidnapped. Uh, there was a lot of the what was called the Red Brigade. I don't know if you, you might yeah, remember exactly. that. Yeah. It wasn't um, like Islamic type terrorist or those type of terrorists that we know of today. Um, firefighting, more advanced firefighting school, which was really cool. Um, so you sounds like you learned, had learned a lot of skills. Yeah, it was. It, it just just well, you're on a ship. You got to know a lot of stuff besides what your main duty is. So after that, I went back home for a couple of weeks, maybe three weeks, and then. What was that like seeing your family after? First time I came you home. You go through a lot of changes in basic and all yeah, of that. Yeah, <laughs> first time I came home, I was in my dress blues, you know, the oh. classic Cracker Jack, you know, the white hat. <laughs> yeah. And I remember wherever we went, you know, I, I got picked up at Nashville. And you know, we stopped, and everybody was just had this really cool smile on their face, like, "Wow, Yay. there's a sailor!" Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So. Oh wow. So, um, um, during all of that, you said you did, had a little bit of free time in Orlando. Yeah. Um, what were some of the? What are some of your ho or hobbies or other? Did you start discovering other things that you? liked to do video or, games video arcades <laughs> yeah. book I love to read so I'll, any bookstore uh, that I can find I go to I hung out there was a really cool comic book store kind of a, a hobby store I used to hang out it was called Enterprise 1701 it was a really cool place oh, wow. it was like 
couple miles from the base, I always walk down there. I'm not, I'm not into comic books, but it was just a really cool place. Yeah. Um, hobby shop, models, and yeah. science fiction stuff. Um, I would go to the botanical garden a lot, um, movies. Um, that's about it. Just hang out at the base. Uh, bowl. Yeah, they had a really nice bowling alley on base. Yeah. Um, of course, you know, I didn't get paid a lot. I was getting money taken out of my paycheck for, um, what was that program where you, for college? GI Bill. GI Bill, yeah. Mm -hmm. So, you know, my, it seems like my paycheck was only 50 bucks every two weeks. Ah, and of course, you blow, you, you yes. spin it the first night. Right. And uh, um, I remember one time we were in the courtyard there, and the, the galley was like a mile away. And I was like, I don't want to walk all the way to the galley to eat. I ain't going to cost anything. There's a McDonald's like right over there. And the courtyard was like a little, like a little exchange and a dry cleaner. And we were just, some of us were just sitting there and just like, what are we going to do, you know? And I was looking and there was a $20 bill floating in front, just like, just like walk, you know, floating down the sidewalk. I was like, and there's people walking in and out of this thing. And I'm watching, someone's going to stop and pick it up. So for five minutes, I watched this $20 bill just floating down the sidewalk. No one, so I just stood up, picked it up, put it in my pocket. And I said, well guys, I'll see you later. And I went to McDonald's. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So that, you know that's kind of what I did. You know, stay on base. I didn't have any wheels. You know, yeah, I'd take cat taxi somewhere. Yeah. Didn't have the money to blow on that. So, um, before you left for Italy, um, did you leave from um, from here to go? Yeah, I came home for for Christmas, New Year's, and I think it was January sixth or seventh that I left, and it was a snowstorm. Oh, wow. Yeah, I was supposed to meet these two other guys in New York, and I, left, I flew out of Nashville, went to Philadelphia, and they shut down everything. I didn't know what to do. I was like, oh, I'm gonna get in trouble. I'm gonna miss the airplane mm -hmm. going to, that's the first time I'm traveling by myself right. like, in airports. <laughs> so I'm wandering around the airport in Philly, and this guy walks up to me, and he says, and I was thinking, well, I'm just gonna get on a train and go to New York, which I ain't got a clue. I probably, if I had done that, I'd still be wandering around. <laughs> this guy walked up, a um, little short fellow. He had a kind of this Brooklyn a accent. And he says, are you going to uh, JFK? That's where, I said, yeah. He says, well, I'll tell you what, go sell your ticket, my ticket from Philly to New York. Or you got 50 bucks and give me the money. He was a cab driver. And he had another guy. And I was like, do I trust this guy? And I said, I, what do I got to lose? So I, I sold my ticket. I got a refund on my ticket and I gave him the 50 bucks. And he drove me to New York. Oh wow! That was cool. Oh. So, so all the, the it was a snowstorm, and all the planes were delayed. I mean, right. everything was shut down. So I had my sea bag, and and here I am. And I don't know. So I'm sitting. This is like one o'clock in the morning. I had my head. And I don't know where these other two guys are. And this is and there's people that had tents set up in the airport. Oh. So I'm sitting there, I'm trying to sleep. I got my head, I had commandeered a cart, I had all my bags on it, and I heard someone hollering my name. And it was uh, the other, one of the other guys. His name was uh, uh, Elisha McDonald. Okay. He was from um, Pascagoula, Mississippi. And he had got snowed in in Nashville. So it was very possible that we could have met yeah. up, but I didn't know that. So he had, uh, we were flying out in Pan Am, which is no longer a business. Uh, and somehow he made connections and the Pan Am people put us up in a really nice hotel room. It was the Viscount. Oh, wow. So, uh, if anybody, you know, we're very grateful for that. So we got a breakfast and, uh, and our flight had been canceled till the next day, nine o'clock at night. So, so we go back to the airport and so it was just all day just walking around and seeing the, yeah. the I mean, it was like seeing, it's like, People from all over the world, you know. This is New York, JFK. Yeah. So all day long, I saw it. was kind of some of these movies you like, uh, Lost in Translate. Not Lost. What was that one movie where the guy was stuck on the the terminal? Oh. Um, it was like that. Tom Hanks. Yeah. Yeah, Tom Hanks. Yeah, the Tom Hanks movie. Um, so at nine o'clock, we're gonna fly out, and this is uh, those big old jumbo Clipper Pan Am airplanes, huge. 
So all these people, and they're calling people up, and they call my buddy up. I was like, what's wrong, man? They're, they're not gonna let you fly? So so we, we load up, and uh, I mean, it's like, imagine this is the airplane, and it was just like seats all the way across. It was yeah. like, I was, and I was in the middle of this. <laughs> and it, it was in the steerage, in the back, in the very back. People crawling all over, babies crying, and it's just crazy. It's kind of like something out of Titanic when they're loading everybody up and yeah. them back. And what happened to my buddy was they, they bumped him up. He got to go first class. Oh, wow. And yeah, and I'm stuck in the back with like 10 people this way, 10 people that way for eight hours. <laughs> <laughs> and the food sucked. Yeah. Uh, whatever gruel they brought out, it, was, it wasn't very good. It's not very good. So. so you got to Italy, and how long, um, how long were you there? I was there for two years. So my, the ship that I was going to was the USS Orion. It was a, it's an auxiliary ship. It's not a combatant ship. It was a repair ship for submarines. It was commissioned in 1943 and had distinguished service in the, in the Pacific uh, during World War II. So it's kind of an honor that you were able to Yeah, do now I didn't know what a submarine tender was. And as soon as I had gotten orders to it when I was back in Orlando, I ran to the library. There's this book called Jane's Fighting Ships they put out every year. So I flipped it and I saw it and I was like, oh no, what did I get myself into? <laughs> but um, I'm glad I went to it. It was a great experience. So we flew into uh, Rome. We were stuck there for almost all day to catch an air, a little uh, airplane to Sardinia. Sardinia is a little island uh, south of Corsica but north of Sicily. We fly into a place called Obia. Mm -hmm. And um, that was like, I don't know, one or two o'clock in the morning. And um, there was someone there that would pick us up. And, they, and this was like driving these mountain roads oh, wow. uh, several hours to a little town called Palau. And then we get on uh, to a converted LCM boat to take us out to the ship. The ship was, there was a little, the, where we were actually at was an archipelago, it was an island chain north of Sardia called La Madalena. And there was three islands. There was La Madalena, there was uh, Santo Stefano, and there was Caprera. Uh, La Madalena was where the main town was on that island. You could walk across the island. That's, it wasn't very big. Uh, Caprera was kind of like a national park. Um, the father of Italy, um, uh, Garibaldi, Giuseppe Garibaldi, that's where, his, where he was from. He was buried over there. And, his horse, and then Santo Stefano was a kind of a NATO base. It, there was like miles and miles of tunnels built on this island where they kept special type weapons. Wow. Um, and then the ship was, we were the only four deployed ship in the, the Mediterranean, so we serviced all the American submarines that came, or anybody else that needed it. Uh, sometimes we had uh, British subs or destroy, surface ships that come from Thailand. Yeah. So first time I saw the ship, it was late at night, two o'clock in the morning, we come in this LCM and they had lights on, there was a submarine next to it, but I couldn't really get the shape of the ship. Just, just the lights, the silhouettes, mm -hmm. and just wires. And so we get on board, um, respectfully request to come aboard, check on board, they write our names, whatever, into the, the quarter deck. The weapons officer, or the duty weapons officer, he was there. I'll never forget him. He's probably one of the coolest guys I've ever met in my life, and I'm still friends with him. Oh, wow. His name was Tom Howe. He was a first class in E6. He was there to greet us. He took us down. And now the other guy, I forgot to tell you, we met up with him in, in, uh, in Rome. We found him in Rome. His name is uh, Kenneth Lester. He was from Houston, Texas. Oh, wow. Um, so all three of us. He takes us uh, down to the, the first class mess. Um, the first class mess is where the E6s have their own little eating. And I remember there was a big chunk of ham out of a can. And we made big old sandwiches because we hadn't eaten, I don't know when. And then he took us up to the weapons burning because that's the division that we're, or the department that we're going to be in. And um, found an empty rack, crawled up in it, and then. I remember this chief come in hollering at me saying, you ain't supposed to be sleeping in your civilian clothes. I was like, man, I just got here. I ain't got sheets, a pillow. 
So we got up and we went down to, uh, when you first go to your department, you go to like an, uh, an administrative division because uh, they get checked in and uh, indoctrinated to the ship and the culture too. Yeah. That's part of that. That was called, w the weapons department was divided up into the WO, that was your administrative division, W1, which was torpedoes and the harpoon missiles. Uh, W2 was uh, the armory. The, those guys could be gunners, mates, and some of the fire patrol guys off the submarine. Um, there's W3, that's where I was going to go. That was special weapons. And then you had uh, W6, which was a weight test and quality assurance. So, so a lot of different yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. a lot of different um, so, while you were in Italy, did you have any time to do anything while you were Oh, there? yeah. I mean, it's like, you know, a lot of people, you're not just confined to the ship the whole time. Right. Our ship, we didn't get underway that much because, you know, we were operating, you know, submarines would come to us. Right. So, we, we, you know, we might get underway maybe once or every couple of months if we had to. Yeah. So, um, it was like an eight-hour day, you know. So, you, if you didn't have duty where you had to stay on the ship. Yeah. You know, we go out in town. So um, you to try to some of the guys time. that were on the ship, they had families there. There was a uh, American community right. where they brought their what we call dependents. Yeah. So that was there was an American community over there, and some of the guys that that would never leave. They had married in married local ladies. Yeah. So just yeah. Um, so after your time in Italy, um, where did you go after that? I went to uh, the USS Connolly, so I was on an auxiliary ship. Now I'm going to a combatant ship. Okay. Uh, of course, now remember I was I was a Tomahawk cruise missile tech working in special weapons. Right. Um, this relates to Desert Storm. Um, this was I was there. I, I went in the Navy in 1988, and I checked on board the Orion in '89, and. Christmas time era of 1990, you know, things were winding up to uh, Desert Storm, you know. Yeah. Uh, well, even earlier than that, um, us being forward deployed, we had a lot of submarines. Submarines that were going back, we were doing a lot of weapon loads, you know. We were taking weapons, they were switching torpedoes out for Tomahawk cruise missiles. And I remember Christmas Eve, um, we had an emergency loadout, I mean, summer came in and we were just loading, loading them up with Tomahawk cruise missiles. Wow. Um, so did you, um, where, where was that? This is in Sardinia. Okay, Sardinia after yeah. that, okay. So, and I remember, you know, we were always on alert because uh, I guess they were Iraqi students. Yeah. And I remember we had a couple submarines alongside and we had a, a security alert. Supposedly there were snipers up on out on this mountain. The Italian, now the Italians had a little base, and they got all crazy. It was I mean, the whole ship went down, locked down. We had every gun on the ship. Um, I didn't sleep for three or four days. Uh, now the security of the ship, that was us. We were in charge of that, and then everybody else were sort of security, but you know we were the top tier. Right. So. I was like on a special so like anti-terrorist, you yeah. know, special crash and bash going. So the we, we had everybody on the ship that was on the ship had rifles and stuff. And then I was on a on a twenty millimeter. And I was on that thing like for like seems like two days. Wow. But, but it was and we, the, the submarines. There was actually a SEAL team on one of the submarines, and I remember the SEAL team uh, putting grenades on. And, and then they went off looking for these these supposedly snipers. Yeah. So it got exciting. You know, a lot of security. Of course, there were club meds uh, resorts, and these were run by the French. And of course, we're in Italy, well, Sardinia, and there's the mafia. Yeah. They didn't get along. If they didn't pay their dues, the mafia would come and burn down the club meds. So that was happening a lot. Oh, wow. So we would actually send people out to help put the fires out. So. So when I left there, this was before, this was in uh, January, just before the ground war started. So I went home and I had some friends that were going to ships um, right. that were already out there. So when the ground war, 
started for Desertor. I was sitting home, sitting uh, at home watching it on TV. So, and uh, I remember. So were you on leave during that I time? I was on leave when the ground war started. Okay. And I remember sitting over at my aunt and uncle's house and they had a report. I remember when the ground war started, this reporter and, and this, just the whole sky just erupted in tracers and Baghdad. And uh, so I was over there watching that and I was like, here I am home, I should be over there. All right. But um, they were, I was watching a lot of this and um, I were, there was a reporter, and it was daytime, and a Tomahawk cruise missile flew down the street and took a turn. It was, it was probably one that I actually put on the submarine that launched. I actually got a picture of a Tomahawk cruise missile that was launched in, uh, over there from that submarine. And I said, well, that's... That's what you did. Yep. So wow. I didn't feel as guilty, I guess you could say. So um, so did, so did after your leave, did you... I went to this, the destroyer, which was in the yards. It was in the shipyards, <laughs> poor folk, getting the fresh paint. Yeah. So it, it wasn't over there. So, but I, everything that I did for the submarines, that was the cause. Right. And, but I mean, you did play a big yeah. part in that. And we were going to play, once the ship came out of the yards, we did a lot, of, we spent a lot of times, we deployed over there for what was called Southern Watch, Operation Southern Watch in the Red Sea and the Persian Gulf. We were boarding container ships, looking for contraband going to Iraq. Right, so how long did you do that? Um, well, I was on the Orion for, not that, the USS Collin, which was a destroyer, it was a Spruance class destroyer. Uh, I was on there from, I wasn't on there maybe a year and a half, because uh, we were in the yards, which sucked. That was yeah. horrible. <laughs> Didn't have a car, nothing, and it was downtown, and it was dangerous. They thought I was crazy walking from uh, the shipyard over to downtown, underneath wow. the bridges and stuff. I was like, well, there's nothing else to do around here. Yeah. And uh, when we came out of the yards, you know, there's inspections and things to get the ship ready, so we spent a lot of time down in the Caribbean doing what was called Leo Ops, law enforcement. We were looking for ships that had drugs. Mm -hmm. And uh, I got an award. Um, oh, very good. It was good. a Joint Meritorious Unit Accommodation. It's where you have um, like Navy, Coast Guard, and other entities who are jointly uh, co cooperating. And at that time, it was the biggest drug bust in history. Wow. There was billions of dollars of cocaine and as well as bales and bales of, of marijuana and other stuff. So at that time, that was the biggest. That's a big deal. Yeah, and we went down there several times for three months wow. doing this. Uh, I remember one time we had Coast Guards. We always had Coast Guard guys with us, but I remember one time they brought their dogs with them and the poor dogs would get seasick. Yeah. So we were down, we were down around Martinique the crib in Jamaica, you know, we, we go into Cuba all the time at the so Guantanamo. So you got to, got to travel so, a lot. Yeah, oh, when I was in Italy, or over there, I went all over. We, our ship would get underway. Uh, first time we got underway, we went, we went to Toulon, France. That was a regular port stop. I was there for almost a month. It was a, it was a party. Wow. So I went to, I went to travel all over the Riviera. When I had, you know, time, you know, let's go. Yeah. Um, we go to Naples, Italy a lot. We went to Israel for a month. That was really cool. Egypt and Spain, just all over the Med. And yeah. I didn't go home for two years. So the the leave that I took, I traveled. I went to we'll go all over Europe, traveled all over the place. I took advantage of that. That's awesome. Yeah. So it sounds to me like you had just a very fulfilling um, time in mm -hmm. experience in the Navy. Yeah. And, um, what is, um, what do you feel um, you learned or how did you change? Um, and do you feel like it was for a good positive, you know, a positive move in your life? And well, it was a big deal, big positive, because when I went to school, you were either going to college after high school or you are going to work on the farm, join the military or work at a factory. You know, there was... Those who were going to college and those that were going to work, and I had 
I was working like odd jobs with my uncle. Mostly I was doing farm work. You know, I had lots and lots of rows of tobacco waiting for me. So, you know, I didn't, I wasn't a very good student. <laughs> um, and I thought, well, if I'm ever gonna get anywhere, I gotta just go in the military. It's a, it's a, it's a tradition in our family. And, uh, and I would like to say, I, I've, military tradition in my family goes all the way back to the very beginning of this country. I've had ancestors that fought in every war, the Revolutionary War. Um, I had a, a great grandfather that was killed in the War of 1812. Wow. Several that fought during the Civil War, World War One, which is the 100th anniversary. And, I, and my mom's family is from, her Her grandfather fought for the Austro, you know, the Austro-Hungarian army. So yeah. I had a grandfather, great grandfather, on either side, and of course, during World War II, yeah. grandfathers and great uncles and Korea, and of course, my mom's cousins in Vietnam, and of course, you know, yeah. us, the next generation yeah. kids. So, yeah, I grew up, I matured, uh, confidence, street smart, yeah. world smart. Um, yeah. I think it, it definitely made me a better person. And so, um, after you got out, did you end up using your GI Bill? Yep. Uh, well, I, 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 maybe about six months, I just goofed off. Yeah. Um, I had no idea that I was going to go to university. I came home on leave, and uh, then I, I was bored. So I went up to Western, just looking around, seeing what was going on. And I came across a, a course catalog. I was just flipping through it. I said, oh wow, there's some cool classes in here. So maybe I should do this. You know, that was never on my my bucket list or yeah. plan to do. And uh, I enlisted, I did two terms. Uh, after I left the, the, the Conley, I went to another technical school where I, uh, I was, what was it called, a Mark 46 technician, where I could take a Mark 46 torpedo all the way down to nuts and bolts oh, wow. and build it back out. So then I went to, uh, spent four years in Jacksonville at Naval Air Station at the torpedo shop, where we did maintenance on torpedoes and we sent torpedoes to the, the P-3 Orion or the helicopter squadrons. So I was there for four years. So that was the last part? That was my last part, yeah. Which, after two weeks of that, I was ready to go back to the ship. I'm a hate <laughs> great sailor. Yeah. I was trying to get back. I was like, you know, I mean, it was a great place. Jacksonville's an awesome place. The beach, I had family there, but it's just being at sea, that, that was me. So I was ready to get back to the ship. And I was already committed to four years to that. Yeah. So, um, eight, after, it was that time where, I, you know, am I gonna re-enlist? So it was a big decision. Um, had some guys in the shop that uh, were encouraging me. You know, if you do get out, you know, they were you should go to university because I, you know, I had a background. I liked uh, history and um, archaeology and stuff like that. And uh, so I had I made the big decision not to continue. I wanted to go home and spend time with family because I had been away for eight years. I mean, I did come home on leave, but it was like for a week. Right. Um, so I came home, got out, lived with mom and dad. <laughs> <laughs> After that six months of just goofing off, I finally enlisted or enrolled at Western Kentucky University. I, originally, I started what really sparked me when I found that, that the course catalog was uh, cartography, yeah. map making. And I've always been a map freak, even when I was a little kid. So I thought oh, wow. that was so cool. So. I was in that track, but also in archaeology, so I actually kind of majored in both with a little bit of geology. And uh, I worked at the Kentucky Museum, or the Special Collections. Worked in the, well, first I worked at the, the reference library, the yeah. interlibrary loan, but then um, I wanted to see what was in the back. It's a closed, this library, the Special Collections closed stack, which means you just don't browse around. They right. wouldn't let me back there. Yeah. So I said, I'm going to get a job here. So I got a job there so I could see what was in the back. Um, it was an incredible place. And I, I was doing research. I, I got interested in geology and, and Civil War history. And, was, and that was the place where I, I, I gained a lot of experience in that. Yeah. And then um, I graduated in 2002. And well, before that, I was 
I was doing archaeology. Um, um, I got a, a part-time job through University of Kentucky as a contract archaeologist at Mammoth Cave. I had volunteered a couple times up there doing helping our archaeologists at Mammoth Cave, but now I got a paid job, and um, that helped me get a permanent position there Yay. at Mammoth Cave in 2003. So I've been there ever since. Well, very good. Yep. You have a wonderful story. Um, thank you for sharing, um, and I hope uh, I hope everything uh, continues to go well for you. Thank you for your well, time thank you and for, for your service. Well, thank you for allowing me to do this. Yeah, <laughs> thank you for your service. <laughs>